started here. Welcome, everybody. I'm Kim Casco. I'm president and CEO of the Iowa City Area Chamber of Commerce. And I just want to welcome everyone to our Coralville City Council Candidate Forum. I've been practicing that <laughs> the past hour. It's a mouthful. Um, but thank you all for being here this evening, for taking the time out of your busy day to come here and listen to these candidates. Uh, thank you to the candidates for, for being here and um, also for running for elected office. Um, and lastly, thank you to the city of Corville for allowing us to, to use this great space. Uh, so the mission of the Chamber of Commerce is to foster a better business environment. So we'll be kicking off this forum by asking some questions about business-related matters. And then you'll have time as well to uh, write questions and submit them on the cards. Um, but I'm going to turn it over here to Ryan Semp, who's our Director of Government Relations and Public Policy. He's going to be moderating the forum. I'm going to do my best to do the time cards in the front here. And so I'm going to turn it over to him to explain the format and then kick things off. Great. Thanks, Kim. All right, so like Kim said, I just want to thank again uh, the city of Coralville for letting us use their space and for having staff on hand to help out. They're great back there. I'd also like to thank the Cedar Rapids Iowa City Building Trades Council. They're our uh, public policy sponsor. So big round of applause for them. They help, help us make that happen. Um, so I just want to go over the rules really quick for everyone uh, so everyone knows what's going to go on. Everyone's going to get two minutes for opening statements at the beginning. Uh, then we're going to do two minutes per question per candidate. So every candidate is going to get a chance to answer, and we're just going to go down the line. Then two minutes for closing statements. That might be pushed down to one minute depending on time. We want to make sure that all the candidates have time to interact with uh, the guests here in the audience. And then throughout uh, the event, we're going to stop two, three times, give or take, uh, for people to put up their uh, note cards, and we'll collect them at that time. And that's when we'll start asking uh, audience questions. So with that, I think we're just going to get started. And we'll have Cindy kick it off with her opening statement. OK, great. Um, thank you, Kim. And thank you, Ryan. And thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. So my name is Cindy Altmeyer Riley. And um, I'd like to be on your city council. So I'm a longtime resident of the Coralville area. So I actually grew up on a farm south of here, but went to Northwest Junior High, graduated from West High in 1979. Um, but after college, left for a while and spent about 25, 30 years traveling, working in corporate America. Um, so I worked with a lot of different kinds of businesses, um, walked, worked in a lot of different communities. And um, then a few years ago, decided it was time to come back to Coralville and be part of this community here. So you know, my vision for Coralville, first off, let me say kudos to the management of Coralville. From the time that I left to the time that I got back, there's huge progress made in the development of Coralville. And I can't say enough about the, the city management over that time frame and the progress that we've seen in the city. So we definitely want to continue that kind of forward thinking and forward development. Um, and I definitely want to be part of that. So I think um, the, uh, uh, I have, First, let me say, I do have a small business here in town, so just to disclose that. So I think the business perspective that I will bring um, will be unique because I run my own business here. So I've kind of seen some of the challenges before businesses. Um, and so uh, that will be a part of my decision making as because I'm part of that business community. So I'd like to see Coryville kind of develop into a, uh, a place where people want to raise their kids, a place where people want to live and work. So that means we have to have business, we have to have jobs, we have to have fair wages, we have to have housing, and we have to have affordable child care. So um, that'll all those things wrap up in my vision for Coralville. So thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Elizabeth Dinchel, and it's great to be up here with everybody. Um, as I began speaking with neighbors, I learned that nearly everyone I knew in my neighborhood was cost burdened by their rent or by their mortgage payments. And that's when I decided to run for city council. When I wage canvassed at the mall this year with the Center for Workers Justice, I learned that a lot of people that worked at the mall could not afford to live in Coralville. People spoke with me about buses and wanting Sunday and second shift bus schedules, and that there's no sidewalks on Coral Ridge around the mall and at Walmart, making the roads dangerous to walk, which they need to to get to work. 
I want to work on improving affordable housing to increase access to our city and to grow a healthy economy. Affordable housing encompasses the cost of shelter, transportation, and healthy wages. I'm prepared to lead efforts to improve access to our city and fight for the workers who came to work at the mall and the Iowa River Landing. I want to see more effort in attracting and retaining small businesses despite having only 14% of the population of Johnson County, Coralville generates 44% of retail sales, um, about $807.6 million, and it's been trending upward for the last several years. I would like to see education for hopeful entrepreneurs, microloan and grant programs, small business development centers, and a committee made up of small business owners to communicate with council. Small businesses are the backbone of our economy. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. All right, well, thank you, um, Ryan and Kim and the Chamber for hosting this event tonight. Thank you all for being here, and thank you to those who are watching at home. Um, my name is Megan Foster, and I am a mother, a University of Iowa educator, and a small business owner. And I'm running for the Coralville City Council because I love Coralville and serving our community has always been important to me. I'm a member of the board of directors of the Coralville Community Food Pantry. I'm a member of our uh, Communities Planning and Zoning Commission, and I volunteered on a, uh, various other, for various other community organizations um, over the years. Um, my husband and I have lived in Coralville for 16 years, and we are so grateful to be raising our five children in such a vibrant and caring community. And in the time that we have lived in Coralville, we've seen the community grow and change and do big, bold, innovative things. And I want to make sure that as Coralville continues to grow and change, that we're bringing all of our citizens along with us. Um, I believe that community development and economic development go hand in hand. And I'm looking forward to sharing my vision for our community with you tonight. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Tom Gill. Thank you, Ryan and Kim, for your invitation. It's, it's a pleasure to talk to the Chamber. Um, I'm a long-time resident of Coralville. I, have, I uh, moved here in 1956, grew up here, went to Coralville Central, went to City High, sc high School. I have been a Coralville resident my, almost my whole life, except for a four-year stint in the Navy, where I was served in the Navy in 68 to 1972 and rode to Spain. Um, I have, uh, I am very proud of the things that we have done. Uh, this is my ninth council election that I've been participating in. And uh, there's so many things that I'm so proud of, but one of the major things that I'm proud of is the uh, flood protection that we've had uh, and almost completed. And it is, it is completed, really. Um, and uh, we put, we turned a whole area a major part of the community into a into a viable uh, area for housing and uh, and it's back on the tax rolls and then doing that it's not all one person doing it it has to it has to come from us and the legislatures that helped us do that but that's that's one of my uh, one of my things that I was really proud of being involved in the other part that uh, basically I have I have three things I want to get the hospital, the other second hospital building done. I want to uh, see the arena through to fruition, and I want to pay down the debt. Thank you. Hi, I'm Miriam Timmer Hackert. I'm a lawyer, a mediator, and a volunteering mom. Um, right now, I'm working as um, the secretary at the Northwest Parent Student Teacher Organization and the co president elect of the district parent organization. I've been serving on the Johnson County Comprehensive Planning Committee, and I'm very active with 100 Grannies, which is an environmentalist group. And I think it's good to have a more youthful perspective um, and an environmentalist on the board pointing out where we can save money by reducing some of the energy costs we have and reducing our use of paper, maybe reducing our use of pesticide. Um, I think there's a lot of progressive people in Coralville, and I'm Glad that we have so many awesome people running this time because I think a democracy works best when we have lots of choices to choose from. And I'm really happy with Coralville. Um, we moved here when we had a second child. Um, and I really like the Coralville staff that I know and I'm really glad that um, 
they've been so welcoming to me as I started attending meetings and so forth. Um, I think Corval could be more transparent, however, instead of making decisions in the back room, it would be nice if they made decisions out here in the videotaped session, which people do watch at home. So I would like to make Corval more transparent and more environmentally friendly. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for coming, and thank you to the Chamber for having this event. Um, my name is Lori Goodrich, and I'm seeking a re-election for the second term to the Coralville City Council because I'm passionate about continuing to direct our city government to be the best it can be. I feel a responsibility to give back to a community that has invested so much in our family over the years. I want to see seniors, young families, and recent graduates, and all those in between continue to enjoy the services they have grown to expect, as well as find economic security and sustainable projects and growth. As a resident of Coralville since 1984, I'm committed to capitalizing on Coralville's strengths, advancing current goals, and generating a positive impact on the lives of Coralville residents. My experience in serving Coralville includes being a part-time administrative employee for Coralville back in 1998 through 2007. And since then, I've been on the Coralville Comprehensive Community Planning Steering Committee, Coralville Hospitality Committee, Parks and Recreation Commission uh, member and council representative, East Central Iowa Council of Governments Board of Directors, uh, 2017 Citizens Police Academy graduate and 2017 certified elective municipal official. Leadership and decision making for me as a council member means consistently attending meetings and volunteering for activities in all areas of the community. I think this keeps me in touch with people, current issues, and I make an effort to respond to individuals who contact me with concerns. I enjoy every part of being a Coralville City Councilor and would like to continue to use the knowledge and experience that I've gleaned to serve four more years. Thank you. Good evening everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Ahmad Yusuf. I'm just living here for in Johnson County for 16 years and in Coralville for six years. And uh, I have passion to serve people and I'm a good listener and I know how to respond and how to act. I have two doctor degree, my first one from London School of Economics. That is long time ago. <laughs> and my second one from Agris University, uh, Chicago, Illinois. And I'm academic, I'm researcher. I work with international uh, organization. I work for United Nations for almost about 16 years. And also I work as Secretary General of BANAF. This is one of the organization that uh, upgrade the skill of financial institution like the bankers, uh, insurance company, and, and um, I have, uh, when I see, when I um, running for the city council, because I see the uh, deficit on the budget, and that is bothering me because uh, I'm very good with that. I'm very good. Also, I'm forensic accounting and fraud examiners, and I know how to read the uh, statement, the like, um, accounting statement, and how to fix it. And uh, many things that I'm looking for, my goals is uh, for the senior citizen, you know, that to be treated well and also to have a chance to work if they are capable too. And also I need many centers for them to upgrade them and enjoy their lives. And also uh, one of the things that I'm looking for the tenant rights because I see a lot of uh, uh, discrimination from landlord over here. My time is over. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you all. Thank you all. Start this off with a few questions from the chamber, and then after that, we're going to take questions from the audience. So uh, we'll start with Elizabeth uh, here. Uh, our first question is, what are your thoughts on the role of economic development incentives, such as TIF or workforce housing tax credits, in continuing the growth of, Cor of Coralville? 
Would you support continued use of these incentives to further spur growth in the region? Uh, thank you. So I think that TIF should be used really responsibly. And if we look to our neighbors at Iowa City, all of their TIF projects undergo an independent review. And they have to prove that they are viable and that there will be a return on investment before they accept use of TIF. Um, and then they have a pretty robust community discussion around whether or not that will happen. Um, and I really think that having an independent review like that would be beneficial for the city uh, in ensuring that we're not making um, bad decisions. We want to make sure that they are sustaining. Um, so I would support responsible use of TIF. I do think it is at this level when we have this much debt of utmost importance that we do make sure that they are sustainable and they are responsible and good decisions. Thanks. Um, so I also believe that there are appropriate uses of TIF. Um, I think that um, with regard to um, how we have used TIF in Coralville, I think that our investments have been valuable. And I think that um, we are beginning to see the decades of planning um, come to fruition as these projects come to life, many of which would not have been possible without the use of TIF. Um, for example, I have lived in the community um, long enough to remember what the Iowa River landing was like um, before it was developed. It was a public health and a public safety hazard. And so that's an example of how um, I think that transformation would not have happened without the use of TIF. Um, now, I do believe that we have used TIF about as much as we need to um, here in Coralville. I think that um, I would prefer to see developments and projects occur without TIF. If we do use TIF again in the future, I think that projects need to be thoroughly vetted um, for long-term and meaningful community impact and economic impact at the local level. Thanks. Tom? I'm an unapologetic supporter of TIF. I TIF has done wonders for this community, and w you know we've kind of fought this uh, fought this for 20 years. Being responsible, we have been very responsible in what we do with our TIF. Um, that that being said, uh, I do not want to give up that we would not use TIF, and the reason is is because there's there's uh, a lot of uh, things in that legislature that uh, the money is not going to be coming with the backfill and those things. So we have to, we have to kind of stand on our own and we have to wait and see uh, what projects come along. But there, there may be a time that we may need to use TIF. It's a good tool. And it's the only tool that we have, really. So the, the uh, workforce development, I'm very supportive of that. We've, had, we've uh, done over almost 1,000 housing units with that. And that is workforce housing. And if we did not have that, we would not be able to provide workforce housing. And so that is a very, very good program. And I'm glad the state, state has that. Thanks. Hi. I, um, I support workforce housing credits, especially over TIF. Um, I think that Corville has overused TIF. And in particular, I'm concerned about taking money from the Coral Ridge Mall project, which is partly in the Clear Creek Amana School District, and using it on the Iowa River landing, because I really think that those were two separate projects, and that to combine them into one was not very responsible. Um, the Coral Ridge TIF really hurt the Clear Creek Amana School District. The state doesn't backfill all the money, and so the rest of the taxpayers in Tiffin and Clear Creek Amana had higher t school tax rates because of our huge TIF that we held on to as long as we possibly could. And I think it's almost counterproductive because if Corville wants to be a strong business environment, then one of the most important things to do is have strong school districts. And our school districts include Clear Creek Amana and the Iowa Community School District. And so I would really like to see us um, fully support those by not keeping money as long as possible in TIFs. And then the Von Maar issue is also, um, I don't know, I just, I don't know that I really needed a shopping mall and I certainly wouldn't want to subsidize it, so. 
TIF has helped us with economic development and has um, already been talked about uh, in particular the Iowa River Landing and we are so glad that we were able to uh, use TIF and um, are now able to see the benefits um, after 20 years and I would just say that um, with the state and with our own uh, record keeping and so on we have uh, kept everything up to par um, we have um, used TIF in the most responsible way and uh, continue, we're probably experts now at using TIF. So um, it's, it's been a very useful tool. And uh, workforce housing tax credits, yes, we've almost um, subsidized a thousand units in Coralville in the last uh, three years. And so we're, we're positive about those, um, those avenues of finance. Thank you. Thanks. Ma? Yeah. Uh, TIF, uh, I think TIF is uh, an excellent tool, but with very cautious, you know, that you need to use it and to know how to use it. And you need to practice when and where and how. But uh, the city council, they use TIF in outstanding way. I uh, received just a couple of days from Cassie the report and I see that they do outstanding and they use it wisely. And that's the only thing that they need to do because uh, before, before we use TIF, we need to figure out what project that we need to project it, what the benefit that they're gonna gain, the resident of Carville that they're gonna get from that project. And um, I believe when they use TIF, that create a lot of uh, businesses uh, businesses, they uh, generate taxes, they um, open jobs for many uh, Coralville residents. And I believe it's outstanding, it's very excellent. But as I said, that they need to be uh, used wisely. And also uh, workforce housing, I, I believe that is uh, excellent because when I see the report from the uh, city council, uh, I, I believe they doing out outstanding job and I um, support them and I believe People, they need to continue on that because we need to thank them for all the effort that they did. And um, uh, that is, I, I don't, uh, I, I think that is, uh, TIF is outstanding uh, tools that we need to support it. Great, thanks. Thank you. Cindy. All right, so economic development incentives make a drastic, drastic difference in the community, and we've seen that happen in Coralville. So we've done a lot of good work with um, incentives here in the city of Coralville, so I, kudos to the city planners and administrations for that. Um, so we do need to always be careful with TIF. Um, have the review process, I think, is a fine process, but the city council's made some good decisions over the years, and so um, we also um, should trust in them, give them credit, and hold them responsible for, for the decisions that are made over the next few years. We do have debt to consider, and we should always keep that on the forefront of our minds, but projects like the Iowa River Landing development are gonna be huge for the future of Coralville, and we have to continue to grow and develop in Coralville if we wanna keep the community moving forward. Great. Thank you. So the next question is also going to come from the chamber. After this question, uh, we'll take a second to collect any note cards and questions from the audience. So just be prepared with that. And we're going to start with Megan here. Um, transit has been a longstanding issue for employers and employees in the region. What would you do to improve Coralville's transit system and to improve coordination of the system with other regional governments? Well, transit is one of these areas where we see a strong connection between community development and economic development. We obviously need to make sure that our workers in Johnson County can get um, to and from their jobs in a easy and simple way. Um, Mayor Fawcett uh, had the foresight to recognize that transit was a very important issue for our community as he was heavily involved in creating the system that we have in Coralville today. Um, you know, it's a very complicated issue here. Um, there's a lot of different pots of funding, um, state funding, federal funding. Um, so I think that I would be in favor of strengthening our system as that funding would allow. 
I am also very much in favor of um, continuing the collaborations that we have with our neighboring municipalities as well as the county. Um, I think that we can work together to identify gaps in service, find ways to fill those gaps as needed, um, because like I said, it is a very key piece in um, connecting community development and economic development. Um, and it, you know what, if I could dream really big, I would love to see a rail system someday, maybe uh, connecting the entire region. Thanks, Tom. Um, before I begin, uh, um, get, getting back to the TIF and Clear Creek School District, uh, the an annual release, this is annual release for TIF that we're going to do um, for the 12th Avenue release in Mall TIF, the total release per year that we're going to give to Clear Creek Amana is $2,905,000 a year. That is 13% of the TIF release. So the uh, Clear Creek School District is doing very well with our TIF, by our TIF. If we had not TIF that and not improved that land, there would never be the infrastructure or there would never be the, the, the type of retail, which is second in the state we are second in the state in retail because of that mall and that TIF. And uh, Clear Creek is doing very well, thank you very much. Getting on to the, the bus system, um, Iowa City's bus system is a blanket system. They, they blanket the area um, and, and provide transportation everywhere. I, uh, Coralville is a, what you could, Hayden Fry calls a scratch, a scratch where it itches. We only go where the, where the people are and where we can, where we can uh, make it a, a viable system. We've tried many, many uh, routes and we we're always trying to do that. We've, uh, we've gone to North Liberty, tried to help North Liberty out with a route. Uh, it was unsuccessful and the reason is because it is not financially viable. That being said, we will pursue the transit system, and I think it was, it's one of the best transit systems in Coralville. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Tom. Miriam? I agree that the bus system is something that Coralville's done particularly well in the past, and I'm really excited about it because as an environmentalist, it's, well, and as somebody who hates to sit in rush hour traffic, bus systems are so wonderful for the environment and so wonderful for people who don't want to sit behind, you know, 30 cars. Um, I would like to see Coralville continue to work with the others. We've done a pretty good job of working with the Iowa City Transit System um, and their regulations and technicalities that make it difficult for us to work with the school system on busing. But as far as the students are concerned, they need to get to school, they need to get to school. Um, the school district has shipped students um, to try and balance out the free and reduced price lunch numbers. And so it would be really helpful for um, the school district if Coralville can help get those students to where they've been assigned to go to school. And that means that the Kirkwood students, instead of walking to Northwest Junior High, are up at North Central and then up at Liberty High. And the Alexander students from the south side of Iowa City have been routed here to Northwest and West High. So if we can help them get um, to where they need to be, those are the students who need, our, who need the help the most. Those are the ones who are least likely to have transportation or family able to provide transportation. Thanks. Okay. Well, um, I think we established that there's school busing and then there's the city busing and there's federal and state rules and guidelines that keep them separate. So uh, those are some great ideas I, and I think they've been investigated and looked at and um, some of those things uh, just aren't possible at the city level. Uh, I, I see our Coralville Transit continuing to grow in the wide range of time offerings and pick up drop off sites using Bongo. You probably know about that, that, that you can use on your phone for right communication. And I'm confident Coralville Transit is doing the best possible job coordinating with AI, ADA Johnson County seats, Iowa City Transit, University of Iowa Transit, and is functioning well with East Central Iowa transit organizations. The, uh, we have a new intermodal facility that provides park and ride and um, options for bike lockers and its current hub for Megabus. So possibly light rail could come into the area soon, but I um, also feel a little concerned that we not over 
extend uh, to more than what ridership would want. I think in particular of our city to the north that um, just canceled their, their bus service because there wasn't enough interest. So I think our transit system's doing very well, thanks. Thank you, Iman. Yeah. Hi, <laughs> I believe uh, transit uh, right now is working very well for everybody. And um, the only thing that I'm looking for to see more express uh, passes that to, to take the students. Uh, we have a lot of students at the University of Iowa and also Kirkwood Community uh, College. And um, they have um, struggling when they are um, trying to move from Coralville to uh, Kirkwood Community College. But uh, I believe the transit right now is uh, the key point for, you know, that to reduce the, um, uh, the gas emission. And um, uh, also my focus will be the importance of regionally significant places where mix entertainment and culture uh, and work, we need them to come together. Where people they can, if, if I don't want to use my car, if I don't have a car, and I need to go to work. Uh, and also for the school system, they have uh, one of their condition, you know, that the student to be uh, three miles away from the school. And sometimes people, uh, they, they, they are not, they're living uh, about two miles and they cannot get the bus to take, them, take the, their kids to the uh, school. And I believe the, uh, I'm looking for to have that condition because uh, I, I guess uh, many families, you know, that they're struggling and they have uh, a lot of issues with this uh, condition. Other than that, and I think the, um, the transit, they're working very fine and I support what the, uh, what the uh, city council they do right now. And also I have just one point if, you, if I can for the, um, for the okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ahmad. Cindy? Thank you. Um, so yeah, the intermodal transportation <laughs> center that <laughs> it's okay. So um, you know, the inter intermodal transportation center we put out here was a great addition. It was a forward-thinking um, uh, project to undertake and add to the Iowa River landing. So there's three components, though, that we need to better utilize. We do have a Sunday issue with the bus system. We have a great bus system, but Sundays are an issue, and anybody who works or goes to school in Iowa City, it's difficult to say you don't get to do that on Sundays unless you have a car. So, so any kind of limited service on Sunday, and I understand cost constraints, but that's something that we really should look at going forward. Um, the other thing I'd love to see is us to think about a bike share system. So I'm a cyclist. I know we have a lot of cyclists in town. There's a lot of communities around the country who have put successful bike share systems in place. And that would be, you know, definitely in conjunction with Iowa City and surrounding communities. And it's a shared bike. You know, we have the bike rails and you can kick a bike, pop it off and drop it off at another, at another stand. So it's, um, it takes a while to get it going and you, again, would use it only on the um, the the uh, places where you need point A to point B, you know, it's not going to go through the whole city. It's going to be on the high use areas and the high need areas. But I think um, it's definitely something we should put on the board to plan for. So that's two. And number three, you know, I support light rail. I think we've got a ways to go, but that may be have to include uh, Cedar Rapids community or, or expand it more than just we may not be able to support it, North Liberty, Iowa City, but can we go bigger? Can we do more? Um, because that in the long term, um, you know, might be the most significant piece to get people just even to the airport, to the university, to connect all these um, pieces together. So thank you. Thanks, Cindy. So Elizabeth is going to be the last one to answer. If anyone has questions, you just pass them to the middle of your row right now, and we'll pick these up after the end of this question. Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, I'm going to kind of echo what uh, Cindy has said, that uh, I think a Sunday bus schedule is extremely important. And considering that we've added so much uh, retail and hospitality in the area, all of those places are open on Sundays. Um, with the new influx of hotels as well, it will be important that we can add a later second shift bus schedule as well to support those workers. 
Uh, I've had some people tell me too that they're concerned about the transit location at the river landing, that it's not necessarily pedestrian friendly to get there. So I think that's something that we should also consider uh, possibly moving forward, that people who are riding the bus and might be taking the light rail might be on foot. So parking might not be the most important component, but can they actually walk there? Um, I would of course be in favor of a light rail system, but I think that's kind of far off in the future and maybe a little too far for where we are right now. Uh, but I definitely think focusing on a schedule that would support workers would be good. I also would support exploring consolidating our bus system into a county system. We talked about North Liberty not doing well, but um, I know a lot of North Liberty residents that said they didn't even know a bus system was running. So some of this is an education component about do they know it's available, can they use it? Uh, so I think that would be good. I know it's complicated because of the funding and other issues around the university, but I think that there's room to have discussion about consolidating the buses. Thank you. Thanks. So this next question is going to go to Tom. We had a few people ask, uh, what do you think is the number one issue facing Coralville, and what would you do to solve it? The, the number one issue? Yeah. The number one issue is paying down the debt. We have uh, quite a bit of debt um, with the backfill. Um, my, my feeling about the backfill is, is that we should plan on not having the backfill. Because we go through, a, we go through, we start out in the fall talking about issues that goes to the legislature, and we go, we go through the go through the motions, and we want the, we want the backfill, we need the backfill. We hire our lobbyists, we talk to them, we set our budget, we never hear from them. Uh, the legislation, not our not our legislators, but the legislature works on and has their pot coffees and has their has their uh, dinners, and we we're here setting up our budget, and we set our budget, and then we're waiting for the legislature to come up with with the legislation to if, if, if the backfill is coming or not. That backfill, if we don't get that backfill, then the projects that, that we have planned for to replace the, the TIF release is gone. And that's in, um, in year, um, I wanna say 2021, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna be limited on doing some of those projects. We'll still do them, it's just gonna take longer to do them. But um, again, uh, the backfill is, is one, one of the major issues for me right now. And then, and then we have a lot of ongoing debt that we have to figure out how to, how to solve. Thanks, Tom. Miriam? I agree that the debt's a very big issue. Um, and our, our, our current system of government where we invest a lot of money in commercial properties and then find ourselves in the position of landlord. And I'm concerned that Corville's setting up preferring our own businesses over other businesses in Coralville, that doesn't really seem fair. Um, and so I would, I would hope that we can pay down our debt and be more careful about getting ourselves into too much more debt, especially if we're not sure that the project is actually going to bring a lot of money in. Um, there's some confusion as to whether or not the, Chlor the Center for Performing Arts was supposed to be a money maker for town or not. But it certainly felt like it was being sold, that that was something that was going to bring a lot of shows to town and bring a lot of money to town, and it hasn't ended up doing that. So that makes us a little bit nervous about the arena. Um, what if the arena is another program that we end up having to subsidize highly? Um, you know, what if the economy turns sour and there isn't a whole lot more need for commercial property, then Coralville has an awful lot of debt on its hands. Thanks. I'm going to answer the question. Uh, I, I hear what you're saying and I appreciate your concerns and so on, but I'm going to answer the question about, and I would say the debt, and I would also uh, remind everyone that four years ago we talked about that we needed written policies. Uh, we were already practicing these things, but we needed to write them down for good financial policies and I'm just proud of the city council of our staff of our financial department that they have we have four policies that we work from and will continue and so I have confidence that we have a good strategy for paying down the debt thanks thanks Lori come on yeah one of the things that I'm um, just uh, uh, confused me for the deficit on the bad gate. Why, why they getting, you know, 
any business they have uh, two areas. Before, uh, if I have project, I need to have feasibility study, and I need to know what the benefit that they're gonna back to the Coralville residents, and how the city they're gonna pay back the money that they're gonna invest it. If they use TIF or they use debt or they use loans or whatever they want. But it seemed to me that they have uh, asked, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't get your name. Uh, she mentioned that there's uh, four areas they're working separately and there is no collaboration between them and I believe that is the, the, the main issue. They need, before, to, before they put any project in practice, they need to gather together and all the, uh, uh, sp uh, they need to consult the special people, the people that from finance, the people from engineering, people from the uh, staffing, they need to sit together and they, uh, examine the pros and cons, what it is and where we're we going, where we're we standing. And I believe that is my most, uh, and also, uh, there's one thing, you know, that is, yes, I'm gonna, uh, out of this. Uh, it bothered me when they downgrading the, um, the, 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 um, the bond of the Coroville city. I believe the city, they do, um, they play by the book and they follow the steps. And I don't know uh, how they move they uh, downgrade them, and I didn't get it, because there is no other reason to do that. But uh, as I mentioned, you know that the great confusion, the uh, issues between. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Always I forget myself, and I just. Um. <laughs> it's okay. Don't worry, Cindy. Top issue, and how would you solve it? All right. So the top issue, I agree absolutely, is the debt issue, and. Um, you know, it's the same as your own planning when you look at your own life, which is you have to have a plan to get a handle on it, and then you have to have discipline to, to move forward with that plan. So um, we seem to kind of have a handle on it today of where we're at and what the plan is going forward. So I would say at this juncture, we just need to be careful that we don't in incur more debt that impacts that plan, and we need to stay focused on the discipline of that plan. Um, I am going to deviate because I think the debt is important, but I think the most important issue that we need to deal with is affordable housing and accessibility to housing in Coralville. Uh, I moved here five years ago as a young professional in the winter, and I couldn't find a place to live. And the couple of places that were here were so unaffordable that I thought I was going to have to turn down the job that I really wanted to come here for. And if we want to attract people to work here and grow our tax base so we can pay down the debt, they need accessibility to housing and they need accessibility to housing that they can afford. Um, and I'm not just talking about low income housing, I'm talking about housing for everyone that chooses to, to live in Coralville. And I think that's really, really something important that we have to address. We know, and we're talking about plans for paying down the debt, but um, housing keeps going up, 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 and it's outpaced inflation by a lot, and we don't seem to have a plan for how we're going to address housing. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I agree on the debt, and um, I will take it a step further by saying um, I think we need to find sustainable ways um, to generate economic growth and development. Um, I think that economic development is a complex web that um, encompasses jobs that pay a living wage. It, it, affordable housing is certainly a part of that, um, and community development. So finding ways that we can generate this kind of growth for our community in a more um, sustainable way. Um, I think one of the ways that we can do that is um, looking at attracting um, businesses and industry verticals that um, pay well. One thing that um, I think that we're also going to have to keep an eye on is the changing shift in um, retail trends. And so we have a lot of eggs in that retail basket. And if those retail trends um, continue to shift the way that they are currently, um, we could have um, some pretty big problems on our hands. So I would like to find ways to generate those um, good paying jobs, bring those um, sustainable industry verticals to our community because 
that's how we're going to generate that sustainable economic growth. Thanks, Megan. So the next question also comes from the audience, and we'll start with Miriam this time. Uh, what are your thoughts on the current Coralville tax rate, and if elected, what would be uh, what would be your objectives for the tax rate during the upcoming budget process? Um, fortunately, Coralville hasn't raised their taxes in nine years. Is that right? That's right. Um, so stole my thunder. <laughs> I know that's that's one thing they've done well. I'll give credit where credit is due. Um, Johnson County, in general, is a fairly expensive place to live. We're lucky in the Iowa. Iowa City Community School District that we have a very large tax base, which makes our rates a little bit less than the Clear Creek Amana one. Because um, Clear Creek Amana has a double problem that Tiffin also has a lot of their property in a TIF, um, which means that they can't have full access to that too. Um, so yes, we nobody wants to see taxes go up. It's really frustrating um, as I've met people to hear that they've paid off their house but the fact that their taxes keep going up is almost pushing them out of Coralville. Um, so we want to make sure that Corville is accessible to everyone and that um, everyone can afford to work here and live here, um, hopefully as close as possible to where they work. Thanks. Lori? I'd just like to make it clear that Corville taxes have not gone up for nine years. Thanks. Thanks. Mom? Yeah. I believe the tax system, they're working very fine, and I believe it's, uh, if you're looking for the sale tax that uh, concerning all of us is, I believe it's 6%. And if comparing with Iowa City, they're paying 7%. And I believe that keeping for a long time that way, I believe that is a good job. And also the other one thing for, uh, uh, you mentioned that, uh, uh, the housing, when you're moving over here, you didn't find uh, affordable housing. And I believe rent out basings with the, with the income, with the growth. And I believe, uh, I'm gonna give you just uh, quick examples. Uh, the average income over here for any worker or any, any person over here is 1,000, that for the low income. And the, um, I believe the average for two bedrooms over here in Coralville is $700. And um, there is utilities you need to pay. Uh, if you pay uh, 700 out of 1,000, there's utilities, utilities you need to pay. You have, you need to pay gas to go to work. And if you take in the bus also you need, you need to eat. And I believe there is imbalance between the income and also the housing over here. And I believe they need to reconsider that uh, with uh, the Landlord Association and also people that they get loans, uh, based, uh, get loans uh, from uh, TIF. They need to be restricted with them, so you know that to uh, be um, um, offering, offering a reasonable uh, rent uh, cost. And I believe, uh, they're gonna, <laughs> they're gonna stop me. But uh, I believe this is the out basing that is the most important right now for me. Uh, we need to consider how we can imp we can balance between the income and also the rent or the mortgage or all that. Thanks, Cindy. So yeah, everyone's impacted by taxes. Everyone worries about taxes. But nine years without a tax increase, I don't know how we beat that. Elizabeth? Um, I, I think that's awesome for right now. And what I really hope we can see in the future is as we start seeing release from TIFs that we can start alleviating some of the taxes maybe. So I hope that's something we can look forward to in the future. Megan? I don't have a lot to add to nine years of not raising taxes. <laughs> I think that's fantastic, obviously. And I will say, um, I guess I do have one thing to add. Um, that I think we get a lot for our money. We have a fantastic community. We have um, wonderful amenities. We can see our tax dollars at work um, with the wonderful parks, the trail system, our wonderful um, police, fire, and um, our wonderful school system as well. Thanks. Tom? Again, we have not raised taxes in nine years. We have a hospital. We have an arena that has paid half by grants from the state, thank you to the legislators that we have. 
and the other half is being paid by privately. And, you know, I don't think there's a community in the United States has done that. We have not raised our taxes for nine years. And hopefully, 10. And I think it will be 10. That's a decade of not raising taxes. With the growth we've got, we have not raised taxes. And that's economic development, and that's what the chamber people like to see, right? That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the next question, uh, both the chamber had this on their questionnaire as well as an audience member. Um, so we'll ask that. But I would also encourage anyone who has more questions to get those prepared and pass them to the middle. Um, so the question is, do you feel the council has responsibility to assist with making affordable housing, both workforce and low income, available? If so, what would that look like to you? And we're going to start with Lori this time. Um, yes, thank you. We have worked on uh, making affordable housing, and uh, we have a brochure that shows different types of affordable housing. We first had to come up with, we have a whole page that explains what, or definitions of what affordable housing is. I would just like people to know that we have worked very hard in the last few years on uh, you know, determining what affordable housing looks like. And uh, we've done the workforce tax credits and we're also working on helping people renovate their homes if they fall in uh, the right income bracket. Uh, there's different, uh, well, there's one or two different um, opportunities for them to weatherize their homes and I, I guess that's basically what I just want to say that we're working very hard on uh, exactly how we can assist in affordable housing in Coralville. Thanks. Thanks, Lori. Maud? Yeah. I believe the affordable housing is the main issue in Coralville. And I'm looking uh, for the young fellows, the uh, uh, recent graduates, and uh, anybody. Uh, with a small size family or the big families to find affordable house, housings and also f either uh, own the house or renting the house. And also I'm looking for to um, activate the um, tenant uh, rights and also uh, uh, to see uh, how, the, how the city council or the local government, how they can provide the young people's with the uh, with the down payment, with the loans, you know that to can they can they can own houses, because uh, most of the people they have main issue how they can uh, buy a house, and uh, I believe that is the, that is the main issue uh, for many people. Uh, affordable houses, you know that they need to be um, always in their uh, planning and also any new uh, uh, construction, they need to include uh, affordable houses. And um, uh, I, I think that this is, this is the only thing that they have about the affordable houses. It's most important for everybody. Everybody, they need to have a home with high quality. And <coughs> also, uh, sometimes you know that if you're renting house in affordable house, uh, she mentioned that the definition of the affordable houses, that is, this is the key, what it is, and how we can uh, deal with it, and what. Oh no! <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you know that that we need that we need to have a system. You know that to uh, tell us what the definition, the the real definition of the affordable housing. Thanks. Thank you. Cindy? So Coralville as City Council, we need to continue to be involved in all of the Johnson County conversations about affordable housing, right? So this is a, you know, it's a bigger issue. Coralville has our own responsibility, but we do need to stay engaged with the other um, uh, community organizations um, that are around the county and the state for that matter. So um, the other thing we, I love the way that the, in what I call kind of the old town Coralville, the small houses between 5th and 8th and 1st and 14th, 
um, those small single family houses. There's a lot of good remodels and renovation going on in that area, and a lot of that can be contributed to Coralville. So we need to continue that work in that area because those are the small single family homes that um, are great starter homes for people who want to come to the city of Coralville. Um, also, you know, organizations like Habitat for Humanity, I've worked with them in several communities I've been in. Um, they do a lot in terms of um, helping people in some communities. So, um, and we also need to keep in mind that as we, as we have affordable housing options, we also need to think of the other, um, the other community services that have to go along with that, specifically community child care, affordable child care. So you can bring families to town, but if we don't then also plan for affordable child care in the community, then um, we still have a barrier um, for families wanting to live and grow in, in Coralville. So we need to uh, think of the whole um, suite of services that we need to get in terms of um, house, uh, utility costs, food banks, good transportation, that all comes together. Um, so all that needs to be looked at as a unit in Coralville. Thanks. Elizabeth? Yes. Um, so I... I I support the inclusionary zoning like uh, Dr. Maud was talking about that new construction should have a percentage of it set aside for affordable housing and I do think the council has made really great progress at the workforce credits but I would like to see more money put into the housing trust to support the voucher system and I think a problem that we face in Coralville is that landlords are not going to come down on their rent to the amount that the federal government will accept and I think what will eventually end up needing to happen is that um, we'll have to put more money in the housing trust fund to actually purchase buildings to be managed by a nonprofit developer um, one that's local is, is called the housing fellowship and then they make sure they stay at the voucher levels and people can pay at the appropriate percentage of their wages and I think that would be a tremendous step forward in making sure that there's accessibility to housing in Coralville for people thanks Megan well, affordable housing is yet another area where we see an intersection between community development and economic development. Um, everybody in Coralville needs affordable housing. Um, no matter what your economic status is, no matter what stage of life you're in, if you're a young family or if you're a senior citizen, um, we need to make sure that we aren't pricing people out of our community. Um, so what I'm in favor of is um, facilitating partnerships with um, local stakeholders, um, developers, organizations like Habitat for Humanity um, to come up with some uh, creative and innovative uh, solutions to uh, solve this issue in our community. I love the idea of um, combining that need for affordable housing with stabilizing um, some of our older neighborhoods. And I think that we have a real opportunity there. Um, I also think that we need to take a look at new developments, um, making sure that new developments have a variety of housing type, um, a variety of price points. Um, so I definitely know that this is a challenging issue, but I am confident that um, here in Coralville, we can come up with some creative ways to meet this need in our community. Thanks. Tom. Um, affordable housing in, in our community is a balancing act. It's, it's expensive to live here. I, you know, everybody knows that. It's expensive to live here. And so there's two ways of do, attacking affordable Direct subsidies, which I'm, I'm not in favor of. Direct subsidies, is there, there goes that nine-year tax, ta holding taxes. So what Megan is saying is right. We have to, we have to you know, reinvent, reinvent things. And... Uh, uh, we, we've really tried to reinvent things, and, and I think we're doing an excellent job. You have to realize that there are a lot of people working in this community that travel long distances every day to come here because of the jobs. The jobs are good here. Uh, there, there are people from, from uh, you know, North English, and, and we've got van pools coming from the Quad Cities. Now, folks, outside of Coralville and Iowa City, it's not... It's not the great shakes it, it, that it is here. So, you know, that being said, I'm all for affordable housing, and, but, you know, there, there's just so, so much you can do about it. Thanks, Tom. Miriam? And then before we have Miriam start, if you do have questions, make sure you pass them down to the middle and we'll pick those up for you. 
Yeah. I think Coralville has done a really good job at partnering with Habitat for Humanity, and I believe that Tom privately has rehabilitated some houses. I really support the energy weatherization programs. I think those are great um, for the environment and for making housing more accessible here in Coralville. I think one thing that Coralville needs to work on is dispersing the affordable housing so that it's not all in one school district. When it's all in one school district, that tends to mean there's a lot of families in crisis um, who have mental disabilities, who have physical disabilities, who have lots of barriers, maybe they don't speak English. And so when we have all of our Coralville residents who are living in affordable housing going to the same school, then Kirkwood is at 70% free and reduced price lunch, and that's really overwhelming for that school district. So I would like to see affordable housing dispersed throughout the community where it traditionally does a lot better. You have fewer trouble spots when it's dispersed in small groups in lots of different places. Um, and maybe there would be a way to help do that by reducing some of the regulations we have and some of the um, zoning ordinances that we have for low density zoning and going ahead and making it possible for builders to build a little bit more densely. I think, do they call that density bonuses in the Johnson County parlance? I don't know, this is still an area I'm learning a lot about. But we have a wonderful Johnson County Affordable Housing Coalition and they um, seem very supportive and very excited to work with Coralville as we move forward. Great, thank you. We'll have uh, someone come down the middle and pick up questions right now if anyone has any other ones. Um, but we'll go on and ask another uh, public question right now. This one's uh, sort of specific. Uh, how will we respond to oversaturated, to the oversaturated Fifth Street traffic? We'll start with the mod on this one. I believe they're starting working on the 50th Street and I believe they um, reconstructed uh, uh, and also I have a new building over there, a, l a lot of uh, building over there. They changed completely that from the, um, from the uh, I believe the, uh, I don't know, it's called Highway 1 or Highway 6, that for Iowa River Landing, they're going all the way uh, till the, uh, the stop sign on the 10th Street. But uh, I believe they um, uh, they need a lot of uh, work from the 10th Street up to uh, uh, up to the uh, up to uh, the Coralville. I'm just not familiar with the with the street names, but uh, I believe they um, they they did a good job on, on that one, and um, I, I don't know what. Um, I'm not just familiar with the 50th Street. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's completely fine. Mm -hmm. uh, Cindy? All right, so Coralville in general, we have just not 5th Street, but we have both Coralville Strip, we have 1st Avenue coming down. All of those have traffic congestion on them. And so it's difficult to even uh, picture how we could widen those. You know, there's some minor improvements you can make on that, but really getting people off the streets, whether it's in a mass transit system or whether it's on a biking, better biking lanes, better transportation, pub better public transportation options. Um, because we're a little bit constricted on those. I would love to see um, a footbridge of some sort that went over some of those, either over 5th Street, over 1st Avenue, so that people could move without being mixed in with the traffic. And, and better, definitely better, better bike lanes. 5th Street, I mean, I realize we have bikes painted on 5th Street, but that doesn't mean it's safe to bike there. I mean, I bicycle a lot, but I wouldn't go there in morning or evening because the sunlight makes it a little bit dangerous because you're mixed in so close with the traffic. So dividing those out and really pushing Coralville forward as a, you know, this outdoor healthy living community could pull some of that traffic off the road and, and alleviate a little bit of that issue. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to kind of echo what Cindy has said. And I think definitely getting um, bus stops out to some of those uh, apartments at the 708 and the 808 buildings could help alleviate some of the traffic. Um, I've met a lot of the people that live in those, and they seem to be overwhelmingly students. So I think they would probably benefit from a stop that would take them right to school. But really, I mean, that's the only thing we can do is just try to get cars off the roads in those areas. There's, there's not a whole lot of room for expansion. Megan? Yeah, um, so I think that anytime you have progress and anytime you see, um, 
you know, an area transformed the way we've seen a Fifth Street transformed, you're going to have some growing pains and some things that um, you need to work out. So I um, don't know that I have any um, specific suggestions other than what has already been offered, um, you know, getting people off of the street, um, you know, increasing the transit as needed to that area. I definitely some think that um, with all of our developments and um, with all of the progress that we've made in our community, we need to be sure that we're monitoring and that we're making adjustments as needed. Um, but I can definitely see why that would be a concern as um, one of the things I think is very appealing about that area is that it is becoming um, very pedestrian friendly. So we wanna make sure that um, we have safe traffic pattern and an easy way for people to get um, to and from that area. Tom? That oversaturation is those darn people in North Liberty. I'm just joking. <laughs> Oversaturation is because we have so many road projects going that there's there's really not a lot of arterials to find. You know, we have we have First Avenue going. And we've got a lot of travel travel coming down on 12th Avenue. We've got we've got a 965 that's over uh, overburdened. You know, and there's just there's just a lot of road projects that are going. There's Dubuque Street that's closed or half closed. You know, the, the thing is we've never gotten to the state where where the traffic is settled. You know, and I'm, I'm sorry to say, but folks, it's gonna get worse. We're gonna do for First Avenue, we're gonna tear that up. We've got a, a huge road projects at the uh, intersection of the I-80. Um, 965 is going to be redone, uh, and, and Forever Green Road Interchange is gonna be redone. And those things have to be redone because they're gonna do the 80, uh, 380 interchange. So, quite frankly, um, we we will do everything we can, but but you're going people are going to have to live with some traffic. That's all there is to it. Thanks, Tom. Miriam. I agree. To some degree, we have to learn to be patient and sit in traffic, or we have to learn to take the bus, which is a great option, or ride a bike. Um, I think that adding more bus shelters, um, particularly in the high usage areas, would help because this is Iowa, and one of the reasons I don't take the bus is because I don't like being, you know freezing to death while waiting for the bus or overheating to death while waiting for the bus. So I think bus shelters would hopefully be a low cost option that would help a lot of people. And I'm hopeful that as more and more of us admit that climate change is a real concern, that more and more of us will be taking the bus. And I think millennials and students are really some of the leaders there. So hopefully they will help us push us that direction. Lori? I think everything's been said. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, this next question is going to start with Cindy. Um, we're probably going to ask uh, one more question and then go to closing statements. And then the rest of the time, the candidates will have to meet with uh, all the guests that are here in attendance today. I want to make sure that you get a, get a chance to meet everyone. Uh, so this, uh, this question is, uh, uh, the business environment in Johnson County will always be a key issue in mind for the Iowa City Area Chamber of Commerce and its members. How would you work to, to ensure the business community continues to have a seat at the table? All right, so you know, as a small business owner in Coralville, you know, I think it is key that we um, understand the impact that small businesses can have on Coralville. So the two separate um, large business, small business um, agendas that we need to focus on at Coralville um, are kind of separate. So we need a large business agenda to, to bring new employers to town to really import, uh, employ more of our residents. We also need to understand the value of the small business community, especially in a town like Coralville. We have amazing diversity in Coralville. So that can bring really good ideas um, for the types of small businesses that, that could take off here. And to Megan's point earlier, the retail is not, um, on the right, it's, it's not going up in this country, it's going down. And um, so we need creative ways to make those small businesses, whether it's service or specialty industries um, that come to Coralville. So um, we need to continue an open dialogue. So it's key to have that open dialogue. It's key to have businesses come forward when they say, if I have a regulation or a zoning or a policy that is impacting my business adversely, got to have an open dialogue. Maybe have a, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a commerce, um, chamber of commerce listening session once a year. I don't know how often you get businesses together and say, tell me what it is that, that, um, 
is impacting adversely impacting your business opportunities. But um, you know, we need to continue to have businesses bring those issues forward to us so that we as a council can listen to them. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you. Uh, Miriam and I have spent some time um, actually meeting with business owners recently and, and specifically small business owners and, and kind of listening to their concerns. And I think something we would really benefit from would be a small business committee made up of small business owners who are interested in having dialogue with city council. Um, and I see that being good for two reasons. I also think it's really important that we um, help aspiring entrepreneurs, open businesses in Coralville, if that's really what they want to do. And there's a starting point to that. We find when people want to open businesses, they don't know how to write a business plan, they don't have a mentor, they don't know where to find investors. And it would be really good for us, I believe, to invest in the education component of that. And I know Iowa City has a partnership with Kirkwood and the University of Iowa, and there's some partnership with the University of Iowa and Coralville, but I think building that out and really doing outreach to people of color and women who are interested in opening businesses in Coralville would be good would be good. Um, I think the low interest micro loans that are extended to businesses are also very helpful uh, when the city can provide those. Um, and also sometimes it's hard when you're a new business and you're starting in a build to suit situation especially. Um, businesses might benefit from either grants or again those kind of small interest micro loans so that they can get off the ground and get started. And I think it's really important for us moving forward to make sure that we have open lines of communication with small businesses so they can bring their concerns directly to the council and we can have an open dialogue about it. Thank you. Thanks. Megan? Well, a thriving economic environment is beneficial to the entire community. And I think that um, in Coralville, we are pretty lucky that we uh, have a uh, active and engaged business um, community. Um, we see this um, in a couple of different ways. I um, specifically uh, want to mention the economic development lunch that um, Lori and Tom and I attended a couple of weeks ago. It was held here in Coralville and it was a standing room only event. Um, our chamber roundtables here in Coralville are weekly chamber roundtables. I think it's one of the only roundtables in the area that is a weekly occurrence. Um, those are always very well attended as well. So we do have um, an active and engaged business community here. So I think that we can build on that. I love the idea of um, keeping the door open, making sure that there are open lines of communication. Um, maybe the business committee I think is a, is a great idea also. Um, we definitely need to hear if there are ordinances or regulations or infrastructure obstacles that our uh, businesses face. Um, Coralville has also done a great job of partnering with organizations like the Chamber and the CVB on projects such as retail mapping um, and wayfinding. So I think that we have a good foundation um, laid here in Coralville, and I think that we just need to continue uh, what we're doing. Thanks. Tom? Well, I think Coralville's created a lot of opportunities and a lot of education opportunities. Um, some things that we don't look at. One of the one of the uh, one of the guidelines for this is our sales tax is second in the state. We are second in the state in sales tax. Now, that doesn't say that we're we're not an economy that's that's floundering. We're doing very very well, and I think this council has worked very hard to get uh, all types of businesses. We're we're open to anybody that's got an idea. And there are all kinds of opportunities for small business. There's SBA loans. I mean, there's, there's, there's uh, local institutions that are working their tail off to get, get SBA loans for people. So, you know, when you say we need this and we need that, uh, start looking around because they're already here. And that's, that's because of, of people that have been on this council and legislators, legislators that have helped us. But uh, there's a, it's, it's a good, strong economic community. You know, there's a lot of things that we'd like to do, and, and uh, we, we'll always address those and keep going. Thanks, Tom. Miriam? Hi. 
Um, again, to give credit where credit is due, it seems like that's something Coralville has been doing pretty well in meeting regularly with, with the Chamber of Commerce and encouraging people um, being a very pro-business place. Um, I don't think I have anything to add. And this is, this is one area where I definitely feel like um, where I would be learning a lot. And I'm, I just feel confident in my ability to be able to listen to businesses and able to listen to everyone else. So, Thanks. Lori? I really like this question, so I hope I can use my time from last time to switch <laughs> over to this. I'll try to go quick. I recently just wrote something about this. Again, the question was, how would you work to ensure business has a seat at the table and regulation is well thought out and places minimum burden on our community small business owners? And because I attend as many of the ribbon cuttings and other business events in Coralville as possible, as a means of showing, I show my support and also introduce myself as a resource for business owners. It's important to have business owners involved in decisions that affect the business community and our city. Letters go out to owners when something is going on that may be of interest to, nature, to the nature of their business. And I've been a part of open invitation strategic planning meetings where many business owners have attended and for some planning meetings where there seem to be only a few attendees. The Chamber is a useful resource for information and training and networking, council meetings, planning meetings, informational meetings, and building and engineering departments at City Hall are always open for discussion. That being said, regulations are an important means of providing a safe business environment for the public, and working reg regulations are, um, oh, for the public and working environment for employees. The Coralville Land Use Plan provides a robust framework for areas of business growth and working with business owners. And we can continue to ensure a positive business environment in Coralville. Amen. <laughs> I do better reading than talking off the top of my head, as you can tell. I feel very strongly about that. Thank Thanks, you. Lori. I'm on. Hi. I believe. Uh, uh, small businesses is the key point for any economic growth. You know, uh, small businesses, they do a lot. And they can do a lot. And I see diversity here in Coralville. A lot of, uh, I believe, many uh, Arabs, some Arab Sudanese, a lot of uh, communities over here, they have small businesses. They're running small retailers. And I believe they... Um, they uh, provide a lot to the community over here. And I believe the uh, small University of Iowa small business, this is a great area, the great center that provides a lot of information. And also helping people when they go over there looking for loans. And I need uh, the, this area, you know that for a small business uh, SBA, they need to be just uh, lean more than what they are. They are very restricted and uh, they're turning down a lot of uh, small businesses owners that are looking for loans. And I believe uh, uh, loans with uh, low interest uh, that encourage the um, uh, small businesses. And I also were looking for a large uh, companies, you know, that they come over here, especially the manufacturing. You know, we have a lot of retails over here, but they didn't do good for anybody. They provide for a certain point, but I believe when we have <coughs> factories over here, that are going to change a lot of things over here in Coralville. And that we need to have, a, I believe uh, the city council, they have a connection. They call a lot of uh, big companies over here. But I have a good connections because I'm working with, with many of international organizations. If I get the chance and elect it, then I can bring a lot of businesses over here. I'm not marketing myself, but just I mentioned it. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, I, I believe also the uh, rules and regulations. <laughs> they stop me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ahmad. All right, so I think we're going to finish up here with um, our closing statements, and then we'll close up and let everyone uh, meet each other. So, Elizabeth, you're first off. Ooh. It was first both times, wasn't I? <laughs> um, thank you so much, and I, uh, 
uh, we love living in Coralville. My my daughters go to school here, and you know we could have left because we were renters when we moved here, and and we decided to buy here, and make Coralville our our home. And um, I really just want to see it continue to thrive, and I want to see it be more accessible to people who work here and can't afford to live here. Um, I think that's probably the most heartbreaking thing to me is meeting people who can't afford to share the city with us and uh, moving forward if I'm elected that's going to be something that I really spend time focusing on and it's really deeply personal to me I, I grew up as a, a child in poverty and was able to move out of that but still have family and friends who live in poverty and struggle every day and I just really want to make sure that people who come to Coralville don't also have to struggle in poverty, that there's enough to go around and that we can make it work for them too. Thank you. Thanks. Megan? Well, I love Coralville also. I think that's something we can all agree on up here. Um, and, you know, the reason that I am running is because um, I believe very strongly in um, serving my community. and. I think this is an especially important behavior um, to model for our younger generation. Um, and it's something that I have tried to model um, for my kids. I am, I'm literally raising the next generation because I have five children. Uh, so, so this is something I want to instill in them, this love for community, this, this desire to serve your uh, community. Um, so that is... Uh, the primary reason that I am running. Um, I hope that I get to um, continue to build on our community's um, strong foundation, find ways to um, make those connections between um, community development and economic development, and I hope that I can um, continue my service to our community by representing our citizens on uh, the Coralville City Council. Um, I want to thank Ryan and Kim and the Chamber again for hosting this event. Thank you all for being here. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, the conversations that we are going to have in the coming weeks. Thanks. Thanks, Megan. Tom? I'd like to thank Ryan and Kim and the audience that, uh, listening to us tonight. Um, I've been... Uh, here, there's five generations of gills in this community, and um, my 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 goal is to have a regional hospital uh, because we need a regional hospital and an arena that is uh, a good economic development driver. Um, that being said, uh, it's not about being a Democrat. It's not being a about being a Republican, it's not being a, about being a socialist or conservative, it's about Corville. And that's where I'm at. I am going to, I want to serve another four years because I love this place and I love the people in it. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Miriam? Hi. Um, I want to give everyone a huge thank you for coming out tonight, um, for being involved. And I was, I've been surprised as I've been running for Coralville City Council, I didn't think anybody watched the videotapes, but apparently there are people who do watch the videotapes. So I really want to thank the city for getting those out there um, so that every, it's accessible to everyone. Um, I'd really like Corval to be a transparent democracy where everybody knows what's going on, everybody knows what ideas are being talked about, everybody feels welcome to participate. And I will say that I have been welcomed as an attendee at the meetings, but I kind of feel very lonely attending Corval City Council meetings because often I feel like I'm the only one who doesn't work for the city of Corval or is not already on the council. So I welcome everyone to come and join me um, in attending the Corval City Council meetings. Um, I want to respond on TIF. Um, I do support the use of the urban renewal development areas for brownfields and for things like that. Um, but I think there is an open question as to whether these valuable properties along Interstate 80 and um, you know First Avenue or Interstate 80 and 965, those seem to be very valuable properties. And so I think that it's worth asking the question, did we have to give away the land to Von Maher or would someone have agreed to build there anyway? Um, just to keep, to keep it honest and to keep it real and to keep um, the discussion going. And I think that the Coralville City Council has always been very respectful and very willing to answer my questions when I ask questions like that. So I really thank them for that. 
Um, and lastly, um, I'm a mom. I'm very involved with the school districts right now. And it's really hard on the district when we have a very unbalanced Corville, when we have all of our um, affordable housing in one area and um, a very wealthy district on the north. And so I would like to see those balanced more so that all of our kids can go to a quality school and all of our kids have a chance, have the same chance. Thanks, Miriam. Lori? Two things that I didn't say that I think are important to just remind us all about is that seniors over 55 have more opportunities for economical housing in Corville than ever before. And if they do choose to move or downsize, um, they can free up homes for young families. And the other thing is that uh, the new uh, building and so on that's going on in the IRL is non Coralville taxpayer funding stream. And there, um, we will continue to see that our uh, taxpayer funding stream is not tied to that. I want to thank our, our uh, state representatives and uh, mayor and uh, other city council members who came tonight, uh, those who are watching on TV, in particular those who came out. Thank you so much to all our families, too, and appreciate everybody up here for taking this time. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Iman? Yeah. Uh, I would like to thank all of you and uh, for giving me the chance to listen to me. And uh, I have passion and I have great desire to help people and pro listen to the people and provide my expertise. And I have 25 years in business worldwide and internationally. And also my special area that in account, uh, forensic accounting. And I'm very good in that area. And I believe I have the skill, I have the knowledge, and I can provide a lot when, if I get the chance to be elected. And uh, I can, uh, one of the area that uh, I combine and analyze uh, any problem that provided in front of me, and I can I I will come up with the solution. I'm very good with uh, reading the problems and uh, figure out what the problem is and what they need to be done. Mm -hmm. um, I'm living here just for six years, and also uh, most of the time, you know, that traveling outside and uh, just I'm not just familiar with most of the area, but if I get the chance to be elected and uh, get the inside the uh, city council, I believe uh, I have what it takes to provide uh, something to the, uh, the uh, Coralville community. And also uh, the only thing that I need to see the uh, affordable houses for the senior citizens and I need uh, to have more jobs for them and more activities for them and also for the young kids. Uh, also, uh, I'm looking for the uh, training centers that they combine all the, uh, the city council activities and also that they can provide a lot of information or the information that is necessary for the small businesses and for everybody. <laughs> My time is over, and <laughs> I'm not good with time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ahmad. Cindy? So, yeah, thank you, everyone, for coming and for listening to us. And would like to just say that, you know, I want Coralville to be a family-friendly place where people really say, I want to live in Coralville because... And to reiterate, you know, the few points that I think are important and why I'm running for office promote financial stability and successful business development in Coralville that, so we can employ our residents for make a fair living wage, um, support the residents through affordable housing, affordable child care, and other community services, and to make Coralville a community that celebrates um, a healthy lifestyle, diversity, and great outdoor recreational facilities. So thank you so much for your time, and I appreciate your support. Thank you all. So I just want to say one last time, thank you to the city of Coralville for letting us use this space and for allowing us to use their staff to help videotape all of this. I'd also like to thank the Cedar Rapids, Iowa City Building Trades Council for being our public policy program sponsor. Um, and with that, let's give them a round of applause. Good to meet you. Yeah. <laughs>